What's up, Printouts? Welcome back to another episode of the Printavo Printouts podcast. I'm your host, Bruce from Printavo. We've got an awesome episode with Amy Baker at Thread Hod. Ugh. Sorry, Amy. Threadbare print house. <laughs> it's going to be really cool. She, she's she got some cool stuff, especially if you're going from that manual to auto phase and scaling to hit 1 million in sales. Amy shares her journey there. Um, real quick though, print house was conf is coming up this year, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, November 5th, 6th and 7th in Fort Worth, Texas. Go to printhustlers.com to reserve your seat. The tickets are selling fast. We actually just announced it yesterday, although this episode will probably go out in a couple of weeks. But anyway, make sure to grab your seats. It's going to be really, really cool. First day, second day, third day, just a bunch of stuff going on. Um, and you can see the schedule there. We've got a few amazing sponsors here that we want to talk about. First off, Graphics Source. If you need a solution to help improve your efficiency and reduce costs in your art department, Graphic Source is a leading outsource option to be able to help. I keep talking about Graphic Source to so many shops because they have so much success with them. Just being able to handle production, art separations, um, order entry, approvals, digitizing, all that good stuff, that is GraphX Source, and they'll plug right into your Printavo workflow too. Easy way. You shouldn't be spending all day cleaning dirty screens and you know it. Easy Ways line of environmentally conscious chemicals will get the job done faster, more efficiently, and cost you a fraction of cost per screen. And Oferic is a, a big Easy Way user and graphic source as well. Multicraft. If you've never heard of Multicraft underscore daddy, they are doing some really amazing things. Multicraft is an awesome distributor that you can get ink supplies or a daddy. And you can check them out. Multicraft screen printing and digital supplies for over 50 years have been providing you with top brands at competitive pricing. Now, make sure though, you mention the Printable podcast because you can get an extra 10% off your first order. Also, don't forget to mention Printable pod off a uh, graphic source for half off your first vector separation or uh, embroidery order for digitizing. All right. And then last but not least, Mr. Supa Color. Supercolor is made by screen printers for screen printers. We went to their facility. They're building something absolutely amazing to be able to do really, really high quality heat transfers. And uh, they really understand how screen, print, screen printing businesses work from small to large to be able to help you be able to do that. Mention Printavo 15 to get 15% off as well your first order. So that's really great. You can do it on t-shirts, caps, bags, whatever. They have a ton of different unique key transfers to be able to try out and use. All right. I'm excited for this episode. Let's hop on in. Amy Banker, Threadbare Print House. Thanks so much for being able to join us today. Um, I, I just wanted to give a brief summary of your background and just hop in because I got a bunch of questions about today. Sometimes we like go through the whole story and then sort of focus on today. I, I wanted to try to do this a little bit differently. So, but I do okay. want you to fill in the pieces that I'm missing. So Amy okay. Baker, Threadbare Print House, um, all main founder, uh, big pusher of rock too. I think, did you go to a Portugal trip? No, I didn't go. And also I'm actually not an all made founder, just more of a big fan. <laughs> so, okay. All made fan. <laughs> Yeah, I I saw it on because um, you guys were doing like a festival uh, thing called Threadfast, which we'll talk about soon too. But um, mm -hmm. okay, so big fan of All Made, which they make some awesome stuff. Um, water based shop, uh, been around for about twelve years. That's sort of my high level summary. It sounds like started with a partner, but now by yourself. Yeah, absolutely. So I started in two thousand ten. Um, well, I actually started kind of screen printing by myself. I was lucky enough to stay at home at the time when I was married at the time and my husband had a job. So I was home with two small kids. And so I started a clothing line um, and started selling like organic baby onesies from American Apparel that I would put little designs on. And then I met a friend. And so we decided to launch Threadbare and like combine our you know, she had an art degree and I was more interested in the business side. So we started it together and then pretty quickly, like within a year, she and her family moved to the East Coast. And then I just took it over and went from there. 
That's pretty cool. Uh, we did an interview with Justin at Barrel Maker Printing. He also started with baby clothes. Yeah. Um, that is, I, although I guess they went through it too with with having you know little ones around and everything. So yeah, uh, is it a hundred percent water based? Yeah, we have been a hundred percent water based since day one because when I started, I the only resources that I had was like our um, art supply store on campus at the U of O. Mm-hmm. So the, that's Speedball Inc. And I didn't know about YouTube or any of the videos when I started, so I just kind of used what you know what they had available there which i was buying the the frames that you use to make a canvas and then buying mesh and like staple gunning there's like 500 staples all the way around to make screens and i still have some of those but you know the tension's like really bad and so that's how i started and then um just went with speedball for a while and then finally learned about ryanet and silkscreening.com so i went to one of those classes and um while I was there, I learned about Plasticell Inc. and how that's how it's usually done. And I asked one of the instructors, instructors, like, does anyone do this just water based? And he was like, No, not really. And I was like, Well, I think I'm going to try it. So I just sort of stupidly stuck with what I already knew um, and went into commercial screen printing that way. And then as the years have gone on, it's been great. I mean, I just got back from water based camp down in Fort Worth, and it's yeah. So how was that, by the way? So that, by awesome. the way, for, for people that don't know, um, that's Made Lab, uh, Made Lab.io's one of their events they just put on with Eric at Night Owl Printing, who also does water base um, with you know his crazy setup in Houston. But they do a ton of classes from embroidery, um, you know, he, uh, heat transfers, how to screen print, and then this one, uh, Water Base Camp, which we also sponsor too. So um, but yeah, th- how was, so was that pretty cool? Was it like educational or wh- what was the setup? So great. Yeah. R- educational Eric and Val, uh, from night owls, they, um, they sent homework beforehand to everyone. Like here's a graphic. So print it at your own shop and then bring it to water base camp and we'll be printing it on the oval and then we'll all compare how we did it. So that was a really fun. Oh, yeah. So that's cool. How'd you do? I mean, I think we, I mean, my team got, we, we got serious about it. We like stayed late. It was 103 degrees in our shop and all four of us were just like, we're going to kill it with this thing. So we did good. We should have underbased the shimmer instead of print flash print. But other than that, like our Pantones were on and, you know, we got a lot of it right. So I'd say I, I gave us um, an A minus. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty cool what, what do you feel like are a couple things maybe that you learned from the water base camp that you guys are going to do yeah well i mean one of the good things is that i walked away from there being like well we actually do know a lot you know maybe i mean we still have a lot to learn but most of what we need to learn is around using the auto the rock because we've been doing water based printing for 12 years but we've only um, had an auto since March. So a few months. So a lot of Congrats. it, like, yeah, thanks. It's game changer. It's so fun. I love that thing. There are two manuals for so long, just being able to run the auto and print 500 shirts an hour is like, it just brings us so much joy, <laughs> so much easier. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, you know, things like palette temperature, uh, is really important with the water-based inks and, the the camp really kind of focused on like what you can do so um not really just for beginners although there was some beginners there too but it really you know was like next level like just a lot of techniques that I wouldn't have thought of or didn't realize were out there so it was it was good I definitely worth going to that camp I recommend it in fact mm. I, there was one there was a water based camp a few years ago and that's where I first met you um, at that. Crazy... Yeah, in Sacramento. Yeah, that shop was wild. That was so huge. Yeah, that was uh, Motion Textile, Tom Davenport's shop. Yeah. Uh, I think he's, he sold it, but he's, so he's also part of Made Lab, but that was a big, you know, seven, eight uh, auto with uh, MHMs in there and they were doing water based printing. So yeah, I remember that. That was very fun. Mm-hmm. That was cool to be out there. I'd never been to Sacramento. 
it was one of the first times I've seen someone else's shop because when you start in your garage and you don't come from commercial screen printing, you kind of invent your own way of doing things. And so it was 10 years before I ever went to like a trade show or anything. And once you do, you start to realize like, oh, like everyone's doing it a different way, but kind of figuring it out and we're not that far off. And and so getting to go in another shop was really exciting. Yeah, it's funny. That is one thing that also when we were running our small manual shop too, I had no idea about trade shows or anything. But if there was one thing to do to invest in and spend the time is, you know, fly in Friday or whatever, go to a show for a day, go to the events, try to meet and greet people, just get in the flow. Cause it definitely opens up your eyes to saying, Whoa, there's so much more here than me just goofing around in the, in the back of this like retail store here. I mean, it's so vast, the different types of shops that are out there um, at water base camp. You know, it ranged from uh, I met these guys who work for IBM during the day and then screen print on the side. But since they're remote working, then they're working out of their print shop and screen printing on their manual Um, all the way up to this guy who's starting an operation in L.A. because he's worked in China for the last seven years and had 3000 employees, all water based, because I guess in Asia overseas. Pretty much everything's water-based. Plasticol mm-hmm. is really more of a U.S. invention. And so he had been running this huge operation for a really high-end tech brand. So it's all 100% polyester, which is harder with water-based. Um, and so he was starting up another similar thing on a smaller scale in L.A. So just the like the wide range of what can be done out there. And, you know, he did the homework on hundred percent polyester and it was wild. Um, so it's just, it's fun to meet other people and see how, see how much there is going on out there. And you were basically raised on water base, which is super interesting uh, and feels a lot harder as we screwed up so much <laughs> of just plastic salt printing and didn't have to worry about the, the characteristics of, of water basing. I, I'm kind of curious, like, how did this affect how you charged customers? Because, you know, shops that I see that do both will upcharge because of the extra care that that mm-hmm. takes. Um, how, how did you approach it? Or or was it just, this is what we sort of knew and we're just pricing how we fit, could figure out. And maybe it's how you, how do you, maybe it's less so actually now I think about it then, but more so now that you're, you know, more refined and dialed in. I didn't charge more in the beginning because I think the ink all really costs the same. The the more expensive water base is that it's harder and you mess up more and it takes longer. And, um, but you know, I, I wasn't really charging more until we got good at it. And then I feel like we were charging more because I feel like it's a superior product. It's a softer print and I believe it's more eco-friendly and uh, easier on the environment. So, you know, I was charging more, but not because it was water-based, but because I think this is a better product for you in the end. Um, And we just, you know, told people that we really, you know, we're not trying to be the cheapest. And once we got sort of confident in what we could do and our abilities, then it felt more comfortable to charge, to charge what we feel like is fair and not, look around and see what other people are charging. You know, I haven't done that in years. We've pretty much like worked on our prices and not worried about what other people are doing. Do you think you're one of the more expensive ones in the area or more expensive shops in the area? I think so. Yeah. And I'm fine with that, but every once in a while, somebody will say, Oh man, that's a really great price. I've been shopping around and I'll be like, what? Oh no. (laughs) (laughs) You're like, wait, what? (laughs) No, but for the most part, I think we're, well, I know that we're more expensive than, the other shops in this town. And I don't think anyone in town does water-based or maybe if they do, they charge a premium for it, but definitely no one does it exclusively. Do you guys do, is your pricing more of a matrix or is it like a, like uh, one of the scaling, you know, steps? Yeah. You know, it's so interesting because yes, we have a matrix. Um, and every once in a while we kind of reevaluate it, but for the most part, it's, pretty solid you know we have our printing matrix that just the the standard like number of colors in the design across the top and quantity down the side and here's your pricing 
Um, we've been, I have a, Sam's our operations manager. And for a long time, he's been trying to tell me about, we should have a pricing model based on the number of hours it takes to do a job. Oh, interesting. Which would be really different, right? Um, but then when we were at water Base Camp last week, that was brought up by Connor. He has a big print shop, uh, I forget where, but um, he was one of the speakers. And really, really knowledgeable water-based guy. And, you know... Connor he, in, uh, lo, like, Lone or Lone, yes. Mo- Lone Mountain Printing? Yeah, Wyoming. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So he he was presenting and he brought up that idea and we were kind of, you know, looking at it from the fact of like, so with water-based printing, you often don't know until you get to press exactly how many screens it's going to take because, you know, the, the inks interact so much with the fabric and <clears throat> the style of shirt that you could get on press and then say, oh, actually we do need to underbase this one or um, different things can come into play. And, and so what if you looked at it like the way contractors look at a job where they kind of bid an estimate and say, well, I'm looking at this and I think it's going to cost you $4,000 to put in this kitchen countertop. But then I get in there and do the work and realize actually it's going to take this long. So the final bill is, you know, more or less depending on the project. And so it's interesting to think about, like, I wonder if anyone in the industry would try it. I mean, the reason I the reason I couldn't is because we get paid up front and I don't want to change that, but you know, it would, I think it would be kind of fair to think about how many hours it actually takes to do a job and charge that way. It'd be interesting. How, how would you think about that from the front office perspective to with the sales and the art side, or is it just from a production side? Do you think? Yeah, exactly. I don't know. I mean, I think there's still something about an estimate like saying this is, what we think it would cost and then finding out it it doesn't and changing your, changing your costs, but it would be really different than how I think anyone's doing it. Yeah. We had a, we had a good conversation with a guy um, who was in the manufacturing world. I think it was airplane parts, but his whole thought there was purely time. Mm -hmm. Now I, I think that was easier because it was a lot more, it was a lot more like baking in a way where it, it was a recipe of making a different part where oh, screen printing has so many different attributes that are, that are hard to measure, let alone some of the front office stuff, which can take quite a bit of back and forth and time yeah. you know, to set up. You know how we always talk about that, like the $10,000 order will take like four emails and the 24 piece order will take like 50 back and forth. So all that time doesn't really get accounted for when you're charging customers. Exactly. Okay. So right now it's pricing based on a matrix. I'm, I'm kind of curious though, is like, how often do you reevaluate that? And then how do you look at it? Cause some shops definitely try to do a time study and estimate it maybe for a couple average job sizes, uh, you know, a 50 piece, a thousand piece, maybe in a much larger one, but, um, and try to say, okay, for these couple of jobs that I ran of this, was, were these jobs actually profitable based on the time I think that it took? And I think the ones that actually do a time study with like, you know, physically a stopwatch, they, they truly find that some of these jobs do take longer than just you thinking about it um, and have to adjust pricing that way. How have you guys looked at your pricing to be able to evaluate it again? It's one of our goals, actually. So, I mean, eight months ago, we were in 1,500 square feet with two manuals. And so the goal was really to break even because we we were it was crazy what we were doing on manuals and so we were competing with shops that have autos and so i couldn't really charge you know crazy amounts you know we were kind of getting by for a few years doing thousand piece orders on the manual and charging you know enough to break even Mm -hmm. and so since we've moved into five thousand square feet and got the auto so now the goal is to get more efficient and see if we can keep our prices the same, which are competitive, but not the cheapest, but somewhere in the range. Um, and so now that we're being more efficient and, you know, this whole year is kind of an experiment in that. And so as far as like collecting data on print runs, we've, we've done a few, like some of the easier ones, like here's 
we did 2000 bandanas. And so that was one that was really, you know, it's the same thing for two days straight and really easy to do kind of the math on and calculate if we made money on that or not. And so we've done that a few. Yeah, we did on that one. Was it like a pleasant surprise or was it like, (laughs) okay, good. Like everything checks out. I mean, I feel like I'm always treading on eggshells if what I'm going to do is going to be profitable or not. So I am, yes, pleasantly surprised to learn that like, oh, wow, like what what we're doing is working. That's great. (laughs) Can I ask you a weird question? Uh, (laughs) Do you feel like you pay yourself well enough and that's kind of baked into the margin too? I mean, no, I feel like... I should be making more, but I think it goes back to like, we've been in kind of survival mode here for a little while. And my goal is over the next few years to get, to get to where, you know, not just myself, but the people that work for me, I feel like should also be paid more. So we're in a growth period and, you know, I hope to get there in a few years, but yeah, especially when I, all my other print shop friends in this world seem to own boats. Everyone owns a boat. And I'm just like, what am I doing wrong? I don't own a boat. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. I, uh, yeah, I don't mean to put you on the spot. It was just, it, it's interesting to think about because I sort of felt the same also for a long time. Granted, you know, software company, but also uh, just this constant reinvesting thought of, oh, I'll, yeah. I'll take it later. I'll take it later. I don't need it now. I'll take it later. And I don't know if that later really comes. Unless it's like forced, unless unless somebody says no, this is it, or or it's maybe it's setting a limit to say okay, at a million dollars, two million dollars, whatever it is in revenue, that's when I'm carving more out. That my, I want my salary to be, I don't know, two hundred k, whatever it is, or ten percent of revenue. Let's say it's just interesting thinking about that because you talk about being in this this weird period. Can you talk a little bit more about that as far as where it is? Is it just slow now, or it's just with the new press, or? Yeah, no, it's it's not slow, which is great. Um, it what it is is we we need to catch up like our skills. And then also once you get an auto, then you realize your dryer is not big enough and our exposure unit needs to be replaced. And, you know, things like uh, CTS, those are way down the road, but <clears throat> just it's never, it's never, we're never there all the way. And so like when you're talking about reinvesting like that, like it hasn't even occurred to me to think about paying myself more all I have been thinking about is like, okay, when can I pay off that piece of equipment? So then we'll get the next one. And, you know, like, yeah, I don't, I don't think about my salary very much. I think about my employees' salaries and I think about trying to be more efficient so the business can be more profitable. But we, yeah, I just feel like we're always sort of um, a little bit behind in the equipment that we need. You know, that's an interesting topic. Let's talk about that, the manual to auto process. So there's a lot of questions here. I think the first is when do you think is the right time to be able to make that jump? And did you make it? Was it late? Was it early? I made it, I think kind of late because I was in locked into a lease at our other place and an auto wouldn't fit there. So I didn't really have a choice. I, I mean, I wanted one two years before we got one and it involved moving which is then also expensive and a higher rent at our bigger space and so all those expenses came right at once in January of this year um but as far as like when to make that leap I don't know I feel like other people might have had better answers I if you had the space before when would you have done it probably about two years before we did and I think that would have been the right time. I don't think that would have been too soon. I mean, we were... What was the trigger, you think, for that? Was it a revenue thing? Was it just a, an emotionally, I'm done, you know, I, I just need help. I'm physically tired thing. Yeah, I think it's, you know, watching two people like slave away and do these crazy, you know, six color jobs on a manual in the heat for eight hours. And like the buses just need to keep running all the time and it physically just felt like too much and then seeing autos in action like going to someone else's shop and realizing that you know we were doing the kind of volume 
that would be best on an auto, like, um, you know, 500,000 piece orders. Um, but it's taking us like six days, you know, taking way too long. Doesn't even make sense. How can you make money doing that? That was kind of my thought process. What about the transition? So people that haven't gone through that, what are some things that you think, uh, just tips or advice for them? Uh, it could be things that you did well or things you would have done better. Um, I mean, one thing I did not do well is, you know, I've never, I, I'm not good. You know, like when you go buy a car and you're supposed to wheel and deal and it's a game. I don't like that or know how to do that. And so working with the auto manufacturers is similar in that way. Like these aren't list prices, you know, these are things you can, you can ask for another set of pallets or a PRU or, you know, like you could wheel and deal a little bit. And I probably didn't do that. So, um, that would be one thing to kind of do your research and talk to other print shops. Um, I did talk to other print shops. I talked to a few that own rocks just to kind of, you know, when you're a manual shop, your mindset, you don't really get how it works because if you're a manual shop and you've got your shirt in front of you, you print the one color, then you spin the next color in and print the next color and then the next color. And you do that all at once in front of you. And then the auto will send the shirts around away from you and print the different colors. And so it doesn't take more time to print a six color print on the auto than a one color, but on the mm -hmm. manual it does. And so those kinds of like understanding just the mechanics of how it works, it was hard to wrap my head around. So talking to other printers and kind of getting it was, was really helpful. What, what are some of the other things that you, you mentioned some other equipment that you feel like you're going to need, you know, you talk about bigger dryer, uh, you know, computer to screen. What are some things that are, okay, now I got the auto, but it's clear this is the next couple of things that we need to get to sort of pair it with. Yeah. So our dryer is, um, you know, it's the Aeolus, uh, what is it like eight feet long, three feet wide. And so to me, it felt big enough, but then if you're going to do, if you're going to do 500 shirts an hour on the auto and they're a left chest, then we can squeeze them in there. But if we're going to do like a full back, we have to slow the auto down actually, because they don't fit in the dryer. So that slows us down. So I would say that would be the most important thing since it's slowing down production. We do need to get a bigger, wider dryer so that we can put more shirts on at a time. And then, I mean, our exposure unit's fine. It's working, but it needs to be updated. But then as far as something like a computer to screen, that's that's out of our league. It'll be a while before we'll get there. But the thing is that we're trying to be sustainably minded, and that would be such a huge addition because we could get rid of films and just be, I mean, so much less waste with those. So even though that's kind of big league stuff to me, like, it, it comes up in the priority list just a little bit because it's in our values of trying to be a sustainable print shop. Got it. Got it. What about things that you did well with the transition? I mean, I think I planned it out pretty well. So we were moving mm -hmm. and getting an auto. And so mm -hmm. luckily the place we were moving is only three blocks away. So that was important, but you know, it involves the, you know, painters and contractors and then mapping it out and having never used the auto, trying to map out which direction is it going to go and the flow of, well, you know, UPS is going to drop the boxes here and then we're going to unpack them here and getting all like visualizing all that. I drew a map and on moving day, we kind of knew where to put stuff because I had learned when I moved out of my garage into our little shop, I had so so many great friends and family offered to help. But what happened is we all arrived there with a U-Haul and everyone just looking at me going, where does this go? Where does this go? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> so, so I didn't want that again. So I spent a lot of time like drawing maps and like really when we get there and all these people are helping us move, people know where to put things. And then um, because we were so close, we got to 
yeah, maybe the dryer. We like put it on a forklift and drove it down the alley, like down, drove it down the street on a forklift. <laughs> we did that with a few pieces of equipment. Um, and so that was sort of, you know, we had to rent a forklift and we didn't have one and stuff like that. Cool. That's pretty cool. Um, Switching gears for a second. I, I saw on your site that you guys do a thing called thread fest, mm-hmm. um, which looks like people bring a shirt, you know, the doing upcycling, which is you'll print on it. It sounds like they can get a little tour of the facility and, and helps kind of self promote. I was curious how you set that up. Um, or like first, where did that come from? It was that to, to like help ingrain yourself more in the community? Was it to help be a marketing thing? What was the thoughts behind it? Yeah. So the thread fest was on earth day and it was our grand opening. And so we, we worked with all made that makes sustainably made shirts. Um, we got some algae ink to print with. Um, we, recycled people could bring us an old shirt that we then shipped to a garment recycling facility and instead get a new shirt with the earth day design on it. So, um, it was our grand opening and we were, yes, trying to be part of the community, but also just have a party. We had bands and beer and hot dogs and ice cream. And, you know, it was a really just like a fun party. So we could say like, here we are now, here's our new location. Um, but it started just years ago. We did that. Um, we've done it a few times and the first one was uh, for the women's March. So I think that was 2016. Um, and we just said like, you know, the day before the March, we'll open our doors. You can bring us a shirt and we'll take a donation to Planned Parenthood. Just bring us a shirt. We'll print on it, these different sayings, and then you Mm -hmm. can wear it to the March tomorrow. And that was, that just went crazy. Like we had a line down the block and it was so, so great. Like it just felt really good. And the news came. So it was good for business, you know, people just getting us getting on the map and people knowing who we are and what we do. So we've done it a few, a few times since then, but that was how it started. And it's, um, yeah, I mean, it is marketing. It's also just fun and, you know, giving, giving back to the community in some way and yeah and having a good time and you keep you still do it every year yeah so i think now we'll do it every earth day and call it thread fest and do do kind of this version that we just did now which was the same which was come in um pick a design pick a shirt color and then pick a design you want watch it get printed and walk away uh that's super cool makes sense what um I was reading this article too, and, and it said that you started with a partner, but then now, you know, you're running solo. I was curious if you could touch on that as, um, I think business partnerships are tough and, and I obviously don't know exactly what happened yet, but, um, yeah. So, so how did that start? And then maybe how did it transition just to you or, you know, is it still amicable or how'd that go? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely amicable. I mean, the reason we split was just geographic. So she, um, you know, we started it as a pretty loose side thing, like at my kitchen table one summer, we both had young kids that were running around the yard and it was fun. We were both creative people and her more of an artist and me more interested in the business side, but we came together and hatched this, you know, what should we call it? Let's call it Threadbare. And originally we were going to make our own designs. She's a very talented, um, she had skills in like sewing clothing and um, pattern making and things. Um, And then I came with some screen printing knowledge. So we were kind of combining that and just for fun, like doing markets. And we were sewing skirts and then screen printing designs on them and taking them to to craft fairs. Mm -hmm. And it was, I mean, it was working fine, but then when she, when her family moved back to Washington, D.C., um, and it was just me, I'm not the talented artist, and so that's kind of when I went, actually, I'd rather just do this commercial printing thing where people bring me their design, I know exactly what I'm going to make, 
and, you know, and not have to go sell it. I didn't want to do the retail side anymore. So I switched over to just more the commercial printing at that point. And so, yeah, definitely amicable. Um, it's always been just me, which I think is good. I mean, I, I'm kind of a bossy person and I, I, I mean, I, I think I do okay with a partner, but I'm sort of glad I haven't really had to, to do that. You know, I, yeah, so it's just I've your been way. in charge of it. Yeah. It's been just my way. Yeah, that's fair. I, I do kind of feel it similarly. What, where, uh, what do you feel like is your biggest challenge now for the business or um, even just for you? Pro- probably like data collection and really understanding the numbers mm-hmm. and kind of digging down to see like when we can buy that next piece of equipment instead of just, you know, we need it now. Let's take out a loan and buy it. But actually kind of understanding the books a little better would be be something I need to work on. Um, something we've gotten a lot better at, especially since, uh, you know, the last print hustlers Mm -hmm. conference. I mean, I came back to the shop and was like, you guys, the thing, the whole theme is just let's get rid of customers. We don't like working with just start (laughs) saying no. (laughs) And I really, I really took that away from that conference. Um, great. I mean, it's just a couple of things. One thing we did was, um, we only see people can only come in by appointment only unless you're picking up your job, but you know, eliminating that just people walking in the door. And I think cause we are, we're centrally located. We're not way out of town on the warehouses We're we're near downtown and we have a community vibe to it. And, you know, for better, or for worse, sometimes people just want to come in and hang out and it takes a lot of time. So by saying, you know, appointment only that has saved us a lot. And then we also have just uh, kind of learned how to lean into the customers that we really want and let a few go, um, which has been great. Okay, so how? it Was it raising a price to make it worth it? Was it saying, hey, we, we don't want to take this anymore and being more direct that way? How'd you guys do it? I mean, I used to say yes to everything. And so I have gotten more direct. I mean, I have said, uh, like, you know, those cu- a customer that just like, as soon as people see it on the board, they just groan and go, Oh God. And so I don't want our printers to feel that way. And so <clears throat> after print hustlers, I got a call from one and I just said, you know, I don't think this is the right fit, but you might want to give, and I recommended another print shop in town because I think that print shop just is really a better fit. Like, you know, we, we do the water base. We, it takes us longer. Um, That's what's called tossing a grenade, Amy. Well, (laughs) no, I think it's a better fit. I I think everyone would be happier over there. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know, but that, that's one thing. And then also when people call, I answer the phone. And so I can kind of tell like, this is not going to be a job that, they're not going to be happy. We're not going to be happy because, you know, we don't turn it around in four days and we, yeah, just for various reasons, I can sometimes sell right from the beginning and just say like, uh, that doesn't sound like the right fit for us. You should call these guys. Interesting. What about a, so for a current customer, it, that's how you did it too, basically was doing the same thing and Hey, this is probably not yeah. the best one for us going forward. Yeah. And it's easier to do when we're, having a four week turnaround, you know, because right. I don't want like the, the customers that we really love working with and are happy with what we do and, um, don't come and complain all the time. Those people, you know, our turnaround is four weeks. And so we get them something and then they're already going to need to order again. And so if we are taking on all these jobs that we don't even want to work with, then, we're slowing it down for the people we do want to work with. So luckily I feel like we're in a position and maybe we haven't always been cause I, it wasn't that long ago that I remember the shelves being empty and that panicky, like are, are the jobs not coming anymore? Like what are we going to print next week? Um, we haven't been there in a while, like a couple of, like a year or two. So being in that position of having work coming in and no longer worrying that we won't have something to print next week 
gives me a little more freedom to try to be a little bit more choosy about who we work with. It's interesting on the walk-ins thing too. Do, do you think that was, you know, cause for sure when you start, like you said, you, you do just try to take everything in possible. You're, you're trying to get sales. It's hard. Um, when, when do you think the transition is to trying to be more selective? Like if you were to tell a shop that's getting started, maybe they have two people, three people saying, Hey, at, I don't know, uh, 300k in sales, 500k in sales, something like that is the point where you should start thinking about niching versus trying to do everything. Yeah. I mean, I think exactly that actually, um, Trying to find the niche, which, you know, we always talk about, it's like, I've never just gone out and cold called, or I have a few times tried it, but that's not really how it, how our business has grown. Um, Our business has grown because, you know, I had a relationship with this restaurant because I played ultimate Frisbee with them. And then they're friends with this restaurant and then we did a good job. So then they're telling that. So we kind of grew with restaurants, small locally owned restaurants and breweries in our town. And so that became our niche. And then those types of customers do care about a sustainable product and the water-based matter to them and um, the customer service, you know, cause they can get things cheaper online, but being able to talk to us and come look at the prints and meet the printer, like those kinds of things that became our niche. And so I would say, yeah, like like that 300 to 500,000 was when I kind of realized these are the customers I like working with. And so it was a long time where I still said yes to everything, like, especially when you move your shop. So I moved out of the garage into that shop and it's scary. Like I remember, you know, the rent there was $1,500 a dollar square foot. And the rent at my house was zero. So I, you know, I had a friend say like, Oh, do you have an extra $1,500 a month? And I was like, no, but, (laughs) but I have to make the leap and hope that it works. And so when you're in that mindset, you're like, we will take anything. Um, Do you think that forced you to make like more sales and close more and get more organized and scale more or, or, or sort of, was it already happening with the momentum of the business too? Maybe yeah, no, that, that leap from kind of, you know, originally I was doing it in the margins of my life. Like when the kids went to school or when the kids went to bed at night, that's when I was working in my garage. I was up, you know, that beginning stage of starting a business being up till midnight and uh, I would coat screens, but I'd have to wait till it was dark outside because I didn't have a drying rack. So <laughs> coat the screens as soon as it got dark, lay them on um, Jenga pieces on the garage floor because the garage had windows, set my alarm so I could get up before the sun so they could go gather them up and now they're dry so I can put them in a box. Just, you know, doing all that kind of scrambling stuff on the edges was, you know, how I started. And And luckily, I still have a lot of customers from those days, even though I was pretty bad at it. (laughs) Like, I mean, people stuck by, I think, because of the relationships. And then as we grew, then, you know, moving in, having a lease and a rent was when I was like, oh, this needs, I need to make this work. And also at that time, when I moved out of the garage, I got employees. Mm -hmm. And so that's when I was like, well, I mean, other people depend on this too. And like, also right. that feeling of like, I just, I can't fail, you know, I have to make this work. I hadn't, I hadn't had a job in 10 years. And so this was what I was going to do. So that there's that kind of lights a fire under you. That makes sense. Um, okay. And then, you know, to, to cap it off, I, I think this year, you know, we just finished up about half ish of it so far. Um, what do you feel like you want to accomplish for the rest of this year? Um, so this year, our goal, my goal is to break the 1 million mark in sales. Uh So it's kind of ambitious, actually. It's, it would be 30% growth over last year, but with adding the auto and we've been very slammed. So we're like, right now it's beginning of August. So at, uh, at June, we were at 550. So we're basically halfway at the halfway. So I, I mean, I think it'll work. It might 
might not, and that's okay. I I use the book Traction to organize the yeah. business. Love yeah, Traction. Yeah, me too. So I've done that for years, and I really like it. You know, I think there's lots of good systems out there to organize your business, but I picked that one because other printers talked about it, and and I've stuck by it. And so um, we have all those things like uh, you know our weekly goals, our one year goals, like. Do you use that for revenue too? Yeah. To try, try. And for people that haven't read the book, uh, Traction, it's on, um, by Gina Wickman, it's on, uh, Amazon. Um, and we can drop a link down below to make it easier. But it basically, I I think I stepped into Traction because I felt I was losing a bit of control of the direction of the business. And Mm -hmm. so it was, all right, so every person or department is working in their own right and moving along and so on. But how do we help row this boat all in the same direction at the same time? And what are the metrics then that we can measure each department on and making sure that they're hitting those so that we are moving forward? And and basically, there's a lot of principles in there that I, they took, like right seat, uh, right person, mm-hmm. you know, for, for hiring the right person, but maybe they're in the wrong seat or vice versa. Um, or wrong person, wrong seat, and they just need to go. But yeah, and then you create a a a scorecard basically, and so the scorecard looks at uh, weekly goals, which add into monthly, which add into quarterly, annual, and and so on. But every department maybe has two goals, three goals, some something like that, like a KPI that can actually be measured. Yeah, and we actually found that the people that we talk about this weekly goal with and, and bring it up every single you know Tuesday morning or whenever you have your weekly meeting, they do start to think about that number a lot as a, oh, okay, how do I like improve? And it didn't happen the first couple of weeks. It was probably the second month or so where people started to, I'm curious what your thoughts of, of how this happened too, but it was like, oh, wow. They were coming up with ideas of how to push that forward. Yeah. And then using the scorecard was a great just business level dashboard of how things were going. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we, yeah, the same, <clears throat> the scorecard and the num. So like each person has a number that you kind of report on each week. Um, that, well, we had to scrap it when we moved because everything changed. Like people, we didn't know what people's numbers should be. And then we've gotten so busy that we haven't picked it up again. So that's something we need to work on. But um, the rest of it, like really understanding the three unique parts of our business and, you know, making decisions based on our core values. And does everybody know our core values? And because we're kind of going back to the basics, I think we have new staff now and a new shop. And so we're starting over a little bit. But um, I mean, the best thing it's done is make us all feel really cohesive and I've been really transparent about it. So I actually created a slideshow with all the traction information and, and more, and we all sit down together once a quarter and go over these goals and, you know, our culture and their values and the numbers. And I, you know, I'm willing to share revenue numbers with everyone so that everyone can see, I do have a plan here because it's been very chaotic moving the shop, learning how to use an auto. Basically everyone had a new position at the start of this year and then we hired new people. So it's just, it's been hard. And so my, what I'm trying to do right now is let everyone know that like, I I do have a plan. Like I'm not just coming in here every day and <laughs> making decisions. Like, you know, there there's goals involved and here's what we could do to meet these goals. And so that sort of organization alone helps. And then also you were talking about it on, I think on one of your podcasts about meeting the one-on-ones. Do you remember when you were talking about that recently? <clears throat> yeah. So we started doing that too. And that because prior to that, I was, have, we have two all staff meetings a week, Monday and Wednesday morning. It's just to make sure everyone knows like what jobs are on track and what ones might have to get pushed because of deadlines and stuff. And, um, I just kept being like, does anyone have anything like, like what, you know, trying to make it really open and no one would say anything. And then I would sit down in like a one-on-one and like 
people have a lot to say, you know? So I just learned that like people really hmm. were way more. That's interesting. Oh yeah. <clears throat> so what, what did you ask in the one-on-one where they started to open up a lot more? Just like, is there anything that would make your job easier? Um, how do you feel like the communication is here? Um, stuff like that. To, like, did you get good ideas back of things to implement or, or was it like things I'm having trouble with? Well, so w- well, one of the things I learned from that is that I need solution oriented feedback because I mean, everyone complains about, you know, people complain about their jobs there. It's a job, but I, right. because we moved and had so many problems, I feel like the first month or two in our new shop was like, me standing in the middle of the warehouse while people just came up and told me problems like, for a long time. So I was getting really burned out on it. And so I was like, we, I understand there's problems. I understand we need new things. So I made a list of all the things we needed, you know, right down to magnetic embroidery hoops. And we just needed a lot of stuff and we can't buy it all at once. And so putting that on a dry erase board, on so I'm like I, I see it everyone I want you to know I hear it you don't have to tell me every day that we need new things so it's all right here on this list um and then getting getting so we've slowly chipped away at it and that way people can see progress too like we are getting we we did buy new auto more auto screens and we did need some 280s but you know the, everything costs a lot of money so you have to do it in increments you know going back to the one million dollar goal um what do you think are the things that you're doing to try to hit it? Right now we're trying to turn things around faster because we don't have a shortage of work. Um, I mean, mm-hmm. one of the reasons I knew it was time to get an auto and move was because we were turning away work we wanted because we just, we couldn't like um, Oregon country fair is a big deal in our town and it's, th- it's thousands of shirts and it's those 2000 bandanas that I mentioned earlier um, we could not have done that on manuals. And so um, being in, so we got that job this year and there's been other ones that we couldn't have, I would have had to say no to last year, but we've been able to do them. So it's really not about like outreach or sales. It's really more about like doing a really good job. You just accept the capacity. Yeah. Like now the jobs are there. We just have to do a good job and, and turn them around in a decent time. Cause right now, I mean, July was really insane. We had the largest track meet ever held on American soil come to Eugene and uh, we printed for ASICs. And then, you know, a lot of businesses in town wanted stuff on the shelves because we had so many people coming to town. And so we just did a lot in July and um, we had to tell people our turnaround was like six weeks at one point. And that's just a, bummer that's just way too long so yeah we're just trying to start shopping around anyway yeah and so we're trying to get back to that two weeks so I, I feel like we had a two-week turnaround forever and now it's been four weeks so i think getting faster and better at what we do you know things like going to water-based camp we learned a lot and we just we really want to be good water-based printers <clears throat> and so we're still getting there and so working on those skills is really what what we need to do right now yeah, so so it's so it's if you can get more efficient, the thought is we can get our turnaround time down, which means that we can accept more jobs. Yeah, exactly. Which means hit the, the big seven figure mark. Yeah, I'll rep- that's awesome. That's that is such a big accomplishment, and I feel like uh, it, it's clear like you've created momentum, and so it's it's almost like letting the business momentum keep moving forward. Obviously you're doing a ton to push that and create that momentum still, but it's, it's sort of like, okay, how do I get out of the way of the momentum and let it keep moving forward with what you talk about on the efficiency side, on the people training Mm -hmm. side with, with, you know, getting the equipment that you need. Yeah. Right. People right seats has been like, we have such a great team right now. Like people are excited to use the auto. People are excited about the customers we're working with and, what we can do with water-based and in our embroidery. Um, And we've been doing more heat pressing. And just like all the departments are really, we have a really good team. So I feel like we're going to finish the year strong. Heck yeah. All right. You better post us something about it. Maybe. maybe No, maybe. Yeah. Well, you'll know if I made it or not, because I won't post it if we don't. (laughs) Yeah, there we go. (laughs) 
Awesome. This is Amy at Threadbare Print House. You can follow her at, you want to give your idea? Yeah, handle? our Instagram is Threadbare Print House. Sweet. All right. That yeah. was easy. I was going to guess that, but <laughs> you never uh, know. Then if it was like Eugene Threadbare, yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Well, thanks so much, Amy, for being able to join us. You guys can follow her at Threadbare Print House on Instagram. Thank you again for listening to another episode of Print House's podcast. We'll see you on the next episode. And at Pernosos Conf. Yeah. I need to make sure to shout this one out. Saturday, Sunday, and Monday in Fort Worth, November 5th, 6th, and 7th. I need to double check the dates. I recorded this before <laughs> and I said it at the wrong one. 5th, 6th, and 7th. I think that's right. Yeah. All right, cool. Well, Bruce, thank you. It's really an honor. I'm really a big fan of what you guys do with your podcast for the industry. And I listen to a lot of them. And it's, so thanks. Thanks for having me on. It's an honor. Yeah, of course. Of course. Thanks, Amy. Mm-hmm.